Hello, and welcome to Into the Abyss podcast. I'm here with my friend, Mike, and uh, this is your second time on. Happy to have you back. It's good to be here. Yeah, so we have done a lot of preparation for this, uh, this episode, not to set uh, expectations too high, but we're, I'm going to set them high because this uh, we're we're going to have a we're going to go deep here, um, and uh, you may have heard uh, one of my kids um, making some kind of sound in the background there. Um, that's just the way things are. So <laughs> I understand. There there may be more of that to come, and we're just going to roll with it. Um, we may have what was the the BBC uh, the commentator on BBC who had the kid coming up in the background doing a little dance. We might have some of that. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> that the guy who was in uh, Korea, was it? Yeah, yeah. Was he in, in? Was he in Korea at the time? I know he was talking about Korea. I, 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 uh, I think he was. Actually, I'm not sure. No, now. I don't know. I don't think yeah. he's. I, I I thought he was originally in Korea, and then he when he was up again, he wasn't. Now he's not. Now he's back in the U.S. But I don't know. And you know that wasn't that wasn't even like that wasn't uh, during the, the COVID nineteen era. That was long before it. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, what made that's, it more novel and charming. It did, yeah. Now that type of stuff happens all the time. Yes. We have plenty of opportunities because people are on the news all the time in their houses with their kids. And, yes. Uh, uh, but yeah, that one was a classic. Um, okay, so um, for, for this, we have read a book um, by Adam S. Miller, who's a philosopher, called Speculative Grace. Uh, the title is Speculative Grace, and the subtitle is Bruno Latour and Object Oriented Theology. And uh, we'll get into what that is and what that means. Um, and then, uh, uh, Mike, you were just telling me uh, before we got on, you, you read another book also. Or was that the same one I read? Uh, or, oh, uh, you mentioned, it, was it Ian something? Uh, oh, yeah, Alien Phenomenology. Okay. Was that the one I read a number of years ago as well? I think, I think it was. I think I mentioned it in the forum and then you decided to read it or you had already read it. I'm not sure. I think I read I it. Only, I only mildly recommended it and you just read it for the heck of it. I'm not well, sure. you know, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If something grabs my attention. Um, but you read this one on my recommendation, more or less, right? Or did you hear about uh, it from me? It's very, yeah. No. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned it. Uh, one or two months before I joined the board and it was a singleton post. So I never mm -hmm. saw it. Yeah. You hadn't and seen that one. Yeah. A while. And then you're like, you might like this. And then you said something more specific about it and like something clicked. And I was like, I, okay, now I want to read it. And it, very yes, cool. it's a very, it's a very me book. It ties into a lot of what we talked about last time, I think. Very cool. Well, um, if it's all right, um, I'll just give like a background kind of, of yes, what these terms mean. Um, yes, yes, yes. to kind of situate it. So um, just, uh, so first, um, uh, the subtitle, it talks about object-oriented theology. Um, and so he, what, he's, what he's doing there is he's, he's making a theology out of object-oriented ontology, OOO. So that's, that's a branch of philosophy. Um, so I'll, I'll just read a little bit. Uh, this is just from Wikipedia, uh, kind of a description of what it is. Um, so in metaphysics, object-oriented ontology, OOO, is a 21st century Heidegger influenced school of thought that rejects the privileging, privileging of human existence over the existence of non-human objects. Okay, so that's, that's the main point there. Um, and then uh, I'll skip a little bit ahead. Um, Object-oriented ontology maintains that objects exist independently of human perception and are not ontologically exhausted by their relations with humans or other objects. Um, and then uh, da, 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 for, for object-oriented ontologists, all relations, including those between non-humans, distort their related objects in the same basic manner as human consciousness and exist on equal footing with one another. So that equal footing's uh, important. And uh, so Miller uh, takes some theological um, implications on this. Uh, the, other, the other thing mentioned in the uh, subtitle was Bruno Latour. Um, and I have not read any Bruno Latour directly. Have you read any Bruno Latour before? No. Okay. Uh, no. Just what he's, um, this is actually, this book was my first exposure to him, but I've, I've since learned some more about him just in other areas. So he's, he's a sociologist, um, pretty famous in the history of the philosophy of science. And um, one of the things that he's known for, and actually, let me, let me pull up. 
uh, I don't remember the names of the book off the top of my head, um, but he's, he's known for two books, especially in the sociology of science. So um, what his work kind of has been before is to go in and kind of like an anthropologist, well, I guess a sociologist in his case, uh, and to see how is it that science is done, kind of like an anthropologist would go into just any community and see how are things done. So it's kind of looking at science as any other type of cultural practice. So uh, his two famous books, probably the most famous are Laboratory Life and Science in Action. And Laboratory Life was uh, one of the uh, real famous ones where he went into a laboratory um, where they were conducting, uh, I believe, biochemical research. And I think it ultimately uh, led to a, a Nobel Prize uh, being awarded. Uh, but he kind of basically just did a, a kind of an anthropological study, like he observed the scientists in their habitat and watched how they did things. Um, but it's, it was kind of um, bringing, bringing science into the realm of a human practice and looking at it in that way. And uh, I think we can kind of see a lot of that um, in, in this book too, uh, with, with Miller. He talks a lot about um, science and uh, uh, the way truth and... Uh, uh, truth and, and uh, knowledge come about um, that's somewhat different than uh, would probably be the natural way of, of thinking about it. Um, so that's a little bit of the background. But then so an, an, an interesting side of this is that uh, um, Adam, Adam Miller is also Mormon. Uh, he's, so he's an LDS philosopher. He does a lot of work like with the Nat Neil A. Maxwell Institute, and he's written books uh, um, in um, LDS thought, uh, uh, like Letters to a Young Mormon was one of his. That's probably his best known. That's probably right. his best known one. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and actually, I, I thought it was kind of cool. He, um, so this book, Speculative Grace, does not mention Mormonism at all. Um, but um, there was a blog post where he said, quote, it is, I think, the most rigorous, speculative, and systematic attempt at a professional take on Mormon philosophy ever, close quote. Um, so that's how that's how he described the book uh, to those in the know <laughs> in uh, in Mormon studies. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, if you uh, if you know some about the, the history of Mormon philosophy and, and Mormon metaphysics, you can see uh, uh, the applications to it because uh, it's a very non um, non traditional type of theology. The metaphysics in it is very different. Yeah, I, I thought the introduction by Levi Bryant at the end when he was like, well, this is cute, you know, I respect you for this, but, you know, that's that's good for you. You know, it was a little bit patronizing, <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's too bad, because it really, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess I can see why one would be discouraged, but it's, um, uh, I, I think, um one of my favorite lines is toward the end where he says, you know, atheism is not a rejection of religion. It's an invitation to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, oh, uh, before I, I forget about this, there's a yeah. book called, uh, I mentioned on the forum once, called um, uh, Religion for Atheists. And it's by uh, Alain de Botton. And uh, he one of the things he mentions is, is that Comte had a secular church and they actually had a couple chapels and one of the, I think they're like both two are in Brazil and one is in France and he was like we need to make an atheist religion and everyone's like okay buddy <laughs> you you do you you know and it was just kind of like I don't know it's it didn't quite uh, take I've off huh? yeah no no it didn't and uh I think people are a little more receptive now than before, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, maybe give it a century as long as things don't get too ugly. Um, but but yeah, just just science and religion traditionally both having problems with throwing the baby out with the bathwater is something I felt strongly. So I just kind of was nodding along to the book a lot. I, I feel self-conscious. I don't feel like I have much to add because everything that was in there was like, yes, this is it. This is, yeah. this is, uh, and, uh, I mean, there was stuff that was new to me, but like, I don't know if I have much to add to it. I don't, so to me, I'm just going to try to find things to point out to people to see if they would be interested in reading the book also. It's, yeah. Well, and you gave it quite high praise too. Didn't you say uh, it's like in your top three or something? 
Uh, currently, yeah. I mean, maybe with time it'll wear off. Maybe it'll end up being top five. But to me, you know, it's the kind of book that I would like if someone if someone wanted to understand why I still respect Mormonism so much while, you know, on paper being like an agnostic, um, well, mostly agnostic, I should say, uh, I I would give them that book, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, and if someone religious were to ask me what I think, I would probably just say give them Lost in the Cosmos or Book of Mormon or something. Um, but but to anyone who's those were your other two right a book of mormon and lost in the cosmos yeah the the, the lost in the cosmos and book of mormon have affected are are the non-fiction books uh well assuming that book of mormon is non-fiction but whatever it's not meant it's not supposed to be fiction anyway um those would be the two that are the most important to me um but this one yes high praise is accurate Mm -hmm. very very cool you know and, and it's interesting um that the, uh, this uh, there's this kind of convergence between, or I guess uh, uh, complementarity between uh, Mormon philosophy and uh, and atheism, right? Which is kind of which is strange, mm-hmm. um, but it, it's something that's been pointed out quite a bit because uh, um, the uh, conceptions of God in Mormonism it, when it when it gets really um, studied um are not very similar um to those of the rest of christianity or uh other uh Mm -hmm. major monotheistic faiths it's uh it's kind of interesting well the the, the, there's the first well i I was well i was reading this book i was at I was at a cab with someone. He's like, "What you reading?" And he's not the kind of. So I tried to, my watered down thing was I explained, you know, the God before, God after, and I said, um, you know, there's there's kind of two Joseph Smiths, right? There's pre-bank failure and there's post-bank failure. Um, and pre-bank failure would be have a lot in common with the rest of Christianity. You know, the big thing there was was only about the restoration of the priesthood and authority and how everyone else is wrong and how the Book of Mormon is amazing. That was like the focus, um, you know, and then, you know, post bank, you know, some people would say he went a little off the rails, which is not an unfair criticism. Um, but but it's a lot more interesting to me uh, and is yeah and it's a lot more in common with with atheism but but i my what i would say to anyone who is lds is you know if you believe in the church then you don't think you don't you don't believe what a lot of the people believed after the bank failure you believe that he was still a prophet and so the newer stuff is higher priority that's what they've consistently taught um you know, like whoever is the most, what you know, I don't remember who said, but like whoever is the current prophet is the most important kind of thing. So by that logic, you know, yeah, King Follett is a little weird, but like it in a way, it's more important if or, or more accurate if you're trying to get uh, to what what ideas of Joseph Smiths are. Um, yeah, just to give it a bit of a background there, so the King Follett face. discourse. That's a uh, uh, so there was a funeral sermon uh, for a man named King Follett who had who had died, and and he gave some very very interesting and radical ideas in it, um, and uh, and and I believe it was in the King Follett discourse that he even said, um, um, "I am not a fallen prophet," uh, uh, or that you know if uh, he was declaring his doctrine, I will declare to the world, "I am not a fallen prophet." Um, uh, because, of course, there were people at the time who were saying that. And I think uh, it was then the footnote um, there that B.H. Roberts had talked, gave the comparison of how Joseph Smith lived his life in crescendo. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, it just got bigger and bigger uh, as time went on. Um, but it's interesting, like, yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly definitely uh, controversial elements of his life. Uh, it'd be interesting if there's some relation to that, to, mm-hmm. to the creativity, too. And, uh, um I mean, with artists, there often is, right? <laughs> yeah, well, some of the most interesting Old Testament prophets, I'd say, were also some of the strangest, who, who did some of the strangest things. Yeah, yeah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Isaiah, mm-hmm. Daniel, yeah, the apocalyptic stuff. Yeah, Hosea going and, and uh, 
uh, marrying uh, <laughs> marrying a harlot. You know, the wives. Yeah, <laughs> uh, for a very theological and, and important purpose. But yeah, it was strange, uh, strange behavior. Yeah, your name's Gomer. I'll never forget that. Yes. <laughs> Gomer, instead of Gomer Pyle, it's Gomer the Whore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, let, let, you want to talk a little bit about like um, the the God after idea and um, and how uh, Miller's sure. book kind of relates to that. Yeah. So I, I just want to check uh, when who's our audience when we're doing these besides our fellow. All kinds acquaintances. of acquaintances. All kinds of people. <laughs> General. Okay. Uh, so so okay. No. A, so, a lot so of members, probably mostly God. members of the church. Actually, I think a lot of people in my okay. ward and my family. Okay. But uh, yeah, the majority. Okay. Yeah, but they're interested. So. Um, okay. No. God. God. To I'll make it very short. God before. God after is by the philosopher Blake Osler. God before is the traditional view that God existed before everything and everything owes its existence to Him. Gone after is more approximately Big Bang, and God is an alien, and he's very old, but something else probably existed before him. Uh, kind of some if you could hide a collab kind of stuff going along. So, yeah, yeah. And it, Sorry, I, the, I was on mute there. Sorry, I just wanted to men mention uh, on the the God is an alien thing. Um, uh, so when I think what you mean by that is that he is um, an organism inside the universe, not from Earth, um, but but a being uh, much like us who who lives inside the universe. That's what is that what you mean by uh, an alien? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as 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 Adam Miller says, uh, yeah, an intelligent being similar to us, right? Like God, you know, God the Father appeared with Jesus, and he was in the form of a man, um, and. Uh, or as Adam, Adam Miller says, uh, God is just one of many objects in the universe filled with them, you know, right. maybe he's very, and he's very powerful, but at the end of the day, he is another object, which is quite sacrilegious to most religious traditions, but absolutely. Yeah. It is not, but not to Latter-day Saints. Uh, I mean, th there's some Latter-day Saints that might not agree with it, but even if they don't agree with it, they, they're not going to be like, oh, you heretic, I've never heard this before. Right. You know? Well, and there are multiple, there are different theological uh, trends and, and traditions in the church, right? So. Oh, yeah. Go going back to King Follett, I remember one of the things in there, it's um, when he says, you know, that uh, God was not always a man. The, the verse he quotes is from John, where he says, uh, Jesus says, I only done that which I've seen my father do. And so right. what does Jesus do? He lives a mortal life and he dies. Ergo, his dad did the same thing. Right. So, yeah. yeah um. So, the, yeah, and the, the uh, probably the more common interpretation of that has been that, uh, um, that God, the father uh, of our world, um, also lived in another world and progressed to become God and that uh, he had a father um, and a God right. over him yeah. um, and that there's like a, Possibly, a, yeah, uh, like a chain going up. Yeah, there's a chain. Perhaps there, there's, yeah, there's there's an infinity A to an infinity Z, <laughs> right, as far as a person is going. Or maybe we should say infinity A to infinity M with infinity Z going on right. forever. Yeah, yeah and, and there's lots of ways you could go with this, right? So, like, um, for example, it could be um, that uh, uh, the god of our world is... Um, of, or originates in what we know as the universe that originated with the Big Bang, mm -hmm. or we could expand the notion of the universe to be like maybe maybe there's a multiverse and he created this universe but originated in another universe. Oh, sure. Yeah. What the nature of the universe is is very open, but once you once 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 you throw those doors open, you're going into the realm of uh, of science, which you know goes right. to one of at Miller's main points, which is one of the few points and one of the ones that we definitely both would want to hit is that's brought up repeatedly is that people have science and religion switched around traditionally it's, religion has looked at the stars and sought for the unknown whereas religion has been about a microscope looking at what's in front of us yeah so, so uh, i think and, you said the fir yes, first you said that uh, religion has been looking at the stars but you meant science right science is no 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 tradition i said traditional oh sorry okay so say that again yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> traditionally, science, the religion was about re revelation and looking at the stars oh, okay. uh, figuratively, uh, and you know before Galileo, um, and, uh, and 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 just saying you know what's out there, what's out there, and science has been about what's looking and at looking at what's in front of us in a petri dish, oh a yeah, microscope, like uh, Ar Aristotle or, or, or a telescope. At... Yeah, Aristotle dissecting animals, you know, on the beach or something. Yeah, yeah, Very yeah, close. or yeah, laboratory, uh, literal laboratory. Um, and and Latour says it should be their their jobs really should be the opposite. Um, science is about revealing what we don't know, and and what's mysterious, uh, and is look about looking at the stars and what what the future holds. And religion should be about looking at what is in front of us and coming back to it again um and while it's not mentioned in the books it really kind of reminds me of the principle of repentance where in in mormonism repentance isn't just about not being bad or stopping being bad it's about turning back to god and kind of hitting a reset button um and saying okay i'm not i'm not in this I'm not in mind, this wrong mind frame. I'm going back to the one that I was before and looking at it again. Um, and I th when I think about how we take so many things for granted, we people don't appreciate their families, their friends, their jobs, their their house, their food or whatever, even though in, in the US we are a wealthy um, people better off than most uh, around the world. Um, and, and religion, uh, one of my favorite things about it is, is how it teaches us to be grateful and humble. And religion is practiced as Latour or Miller would have us do it, is about taking that look, you know, um, very, very kind of has an Eastern flavor to it, you know, meditate, yeah. uh, take in what's around you um, and appreciate it and don't take it for granted and just blaze past it and you know, quickly go to some ism or some simple shallow goal that you insist on when, you know, LDS leaders consistently say, oh, it's God's timetable. And sometimes God says no. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and uh, people who can't have, who, who have a problem with that would be what Latour says is people who have a problem with uh, what's called reductionism, which I think is just another way of saying, do which is a very similar way of saying dogma, where reductionism is, um, saying everything can be reduced to this thing you know and religion says oh, everything is reduced to the bible or this these two principles that i found in the bible um or you know science might say oh it's all down to this 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 one thing that's what makes the universe go around and everything revolves around that mm -hmm. around entropy or evolution or or the speed of light or you know whatever i'm not good with yeah well so <laughs> Mil miller talks about this uh he talks about a principle of irreduction, right? I think that was mm -hmm. what he had said. Um, where I think that was Latour's term, wasn't it? Oh, was it? Uh, yeah, I, I get mixed up of whose is whose, but yeah, I think you're right. It's Latour's. <laughs> but 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 Miller really latches onto that, and it's very, it, 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 it jives very well with Mormonism, I would think. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a, a, a two two uh, lines I wanted to read while you were uh, on some of the things you were talking about. So I, I liked how you were saying. Um, uh, about uh, repentance and uh, attending to attending to what is in front of us. Um, so uh, on uh, page 145, uh, Miller says, mark this definition, religion is what breaks our will to go away. Uh, I, I thought that yes. was a very interesting Fantastic. idea. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's related to the other point, right? That, that it, it's, uh, religion is about what's close. Um, do, you mind, do you mind if I read a passage uh, from that? Um, so let's gonna, I want to read the next sentence. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Going to. It says, yeah. The trick, as Latour puts it, is to paint the disappointment of the visible without simply painting another world of the invisible. I really want to break that down. Yeah, please do. First off, like I said in the last thing, every supervillain that has ever existed, real or imaginative, is born of disappointment. I, This thing that I wanted you know, my family got slaughtered, or my my political party didn't win, or the earth is, you know, the ocean is go in a bad thing, whatever. It's always, I wanted this thing, and I didn't get it. That's 
<laughs> to ironically to be reductive that's that's where all the bad uh, where all the pain and suffering comes from and so he says paint the disappointment of the visible that's his it's to um it's you know acknowledge the disappointment of of what is in front of us without just making another invisible world basically dealing with the bad of the world the difficulties of life through other means than escapism um, and religion is particularly potent and dangerous in that it can easily be um, either of these things. It can be escapist and harmful, or it can be practical and direct and again directing us toward what we have, it, it, that which breaks our will to go away. Just fantastic. I, I'm glad that you picked that line. Sorry, uh, your thing now. Oh, I can't, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I'll stop unmuting myself. <laughs> we'll just let the kids play in the background. No, no, no. Yeah, it, I can't hear it very much myself. Okay. Um, All right, sounds I, good. I, I, occasionally I hear them, but they're not too loud to me. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, this one's a little bit more theoretical, but I, I think it relates back to the, the very practical points you were just talking about. Um, so this is on page 119, um, and this is in the section on science and religion. Um, so... Uh, in one case, the object is too distant, too opaque, too transcendent. In the other, it is too close, too transparent, too imminent. Science in, and religion differ in what they address, two different kinds of invisibility. Where science aims to illuminate resistant but insufficiently available objects, religion aims to illuminate available but insufficiently resistant sun phenomena. Uh, science is a third person exposition of the unavailable. Religion is a first person phenomenology of the obvious. Science corrects for our nearsightedness, religion for our farsightedness. Um, and so um, this is um, getting May to- I interject? Yeah, please. I want to say two, two things first. Uh, the nearsightedness, farsightedness thing, another one of my favorite lines. Also, we never explained what resistant availability is. So if you weren't going to do that, you should probably do that first. Yeah. That, um, that's an important term that he mentions. Uh, another one of those things he mentions repeatedly is resistant availability. And you know, I, and yes, to me, I, that's opposition in all things, by the way. But I, I think you should explain that since you brought it up. Well, you, yeah, you know, I, and I'm not sure I have a, uh, a complete grasp of it, but um, as. Okay. Uh, Take a step. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> resistant availability. So um, basically um, the book is about, about finding a way to think of grace in this object-oriented ontology, where it wouldn't really you wouldn't really expect it, right? So, uh, grace theologically is kind of um, what is um, uh, spontaneous and unexpected, um, extra, um, and what is given unconditionally. Right. Yeah. So it's it's not something it, it wouldn't just follow from the natural course of events. It's not just cause and effect, uh, but it's given. Right. Um, so, and then right. uh, resistant availability, as I as I recall, uh, relates to that um, because um, in in this uh, flat ontology where there's all these different objects, um, they are both available to each other and they are able to resist each other. And there's uh, both sides of those um, are what create that um, that spontaneity. Right. So that um, there's no just um, inexorable progression of of cause and effect but because because objects are able to um act and be acted upon yeah i, I see the i see the uh, lehigh in there um that yeah, um, i think is deliberate with saying that phrase yeah yeah you know that's uh <laughs> they're very much like um kind of uh technical terms that uh, seem to yeah be lifted up out of uh, uh either the book of mormon or uh um, Nauvoo theology. <laughs> um, yes. Is that how kind of how you were understanding uh, resistant and availability? I, like I said, I'm not sure I have the complete grasp of it. But. I, I think that would be the start. And then my first layer of extra understanding um, is I think a common a, a problem I used that I struggled with that I think a lot of LDS people do is they have this idea that when you get married, you're going to be on the same page about everything all the time, 
right? Because you're going to work so hard and how could you possibly misunderstand each other? Uh, th this is like the most, um, this is low hanging fruit, but you know, and it's, it's not like that where, and I recently read something by um, the author Rilke who said, a spouse's job is to stand guard at their, their love at their spouse, at, at their other spouse's um, door to privacy or something like that and, mm -hmm. and, and let everyone have their space. Um, and my wife is the opposite of me. Like she, she's very private and there's things that I didn't learn until we were married for like a decade that were minor that she was proud that I didn't find out until then. <laughs> Just like, and, and I'm very open and blue and busy and, and um, I just, uh, and, and so anyway, I, I also take, I also think about the existential barrier, right? The idea that no one will ever perfectly understand anybody else. Um, and the other, uh, no matter how hard you try. And then there's other things where no matter how hard you try to be private, uh, if you're in someone else's vicinity, you'll perceive things about that person as much as they dislike it even if it's only surface level things like their appearance and their sound or whatever. And, and that, uh, I, I, but this is one of the reasons it's in my top three books. Like for me, it really redefined the definition of opposition in all things um, for me. Like it's another way of looking at that. Nothing fully gels because, because if, if you want to avoid reductionism, nothing fully gels together. Um, but nothing is fully separate apart. It's Venn diagrams mm -hmm. that are not one circle, but are also not two circles for ages, for yeah. uh, infinite sets of that. Uh, I can't remember how he phrased it, but um, that's, yeah. So anyway, that's that's what I would uh, understand. Yeah. The assistant of your ability to be. Well, and you know, it, uh, I'd just like to comment a little bit on, on why, how this is important uh, theologically. So um, how we're talking about, there's this level playing field, right? And even God is on this level playing field. Uh, the influence that God has is through persuasion and coalition building, right? Um, yes, very and, LDS idea. Yeah, and, and, this is, and I guess just to contrast this with uh, alternate views, um, so any type of top-down uh, model of the universe is, is what this is the opposite of, right? So, um, so uh, there's no overarching law that's governing the way things work. Everything is local. Um, right. So even creation, but, but also um, he, he uh, gets... Uh, critical of certain understandings of science, which shouldn't be surprising knowing his background in, in the sociology of science, right? Uh, but that, so science is very much about um, basically expanding, uh, taking theories and being able to generalize, generalize them as much as possible. Uh, so like a grand unified theory is kind of, in physics is, is the great uh, goal, right? To, uh, to come up with a theory that is able to describe everything so that you can just derive everything that happens from it. Um, and uh, that is that assumes that there is some great global uh, force or law that is making things happen uh, the way that they do. And, and so this is one of the ideas that uh, an object-oriented ontology or theology uh, is is pushing back against um, that maybe maybe there are um, there are patterns uh, and things that we observe, but they they come from some other source than than from above, right? Uh, that that's the idea. Or or it does come from above, but it's just above is just one of the many sources. Okay, uh, I think I think I think he uses the word democratic or democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally in there, doesn't he? Yes. Uh, shall we talk about that a little bit? Because that, that's one of my favorite uh, concepts here. Sure. Um, and actually, uh, I mean, if I read a few quotes from that. 
Um, yeah. Did, did we, did we, did we, um, we didn't lose the train that you wanted to make when you brought, I just, you, you brought up um, assistant or resistant availability and then you were going to say something else. And I just want to make sure that, uh, I'm sorry that we do to it, but you, did, did we cover your point that you wanted to make? Um, the, the point I was going to make, um, I'll just mention it briefly. So um, that I, I kind of talked about it, how science uh, talks about things that are very transcendent, uh, especially when right. we're talking about physical laws, right? Those are, those are things that transcend all the objects that are governed by them. Um, right. and then this idea of that uh, Latour and, and Miller are getting at is that religion is what it looks at things that are right in front of you. So, uh, you know, your, your relationships are just, uh, I could think of like the, the breath, um, you know, in your body, uh, the things that are right there. That, those are the things that religion is trying to get us to pay attention to. So it's kind of an inversion of our usual way of thinking. Um, and um, I guess that I was tying it back to uh, uh, the point of, uh, that you were bringing up in the practical side of how religion is what breaks our will to go away, right? Uh, it's right. what brings us back to what's right in front of us and, and keeps our keeps our attention on it. You know, and actually come to think of it, it, uh, it kind of relates to uh, um, Lost of the Cosmos uh, with the, um, mm -hmm. actually doesn't, he talks about transcendence, right? How there are those uh, there's science, art, and um, religion that tries to break out uh, into transcendence. Yeah. I'm going off of memory there, but it, there's La, La, a, lost. Lost in the cosmos might be guilty of breaking Latour's principle, but his unifying theory uh, that, he, but his theory is just that you need a religion, or or uh, otherwise anything else will fail you. You know, like uh, David Foster Wallace's, um, you know, this is water speech. Mm -hmm. Uh, and 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 he, Walker Percy says, you know, if you're he, he basically, you know, the only thing he gives credit to is a summary of Eastern religion as viewing yourself as part of the universe and everyone is also as part of the universe, which is I guess more similar to what this is. Of course, Walker is Catholic, so instead, what he says, yeah, so the, it, it doesn't. He's Catholic, so he would go with the God before and say we should all view each other as mutual. Um, subjects of as creations of God, um, which is also very democratic, but not in the object oriented. Yeah. Sense. Um, so it, it, again, uh, so yeah, some of it overlaps, but not yes. entirely. I think yeah, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that later about the possible overlaps or um, synthesizing of the different views. Um, sure. But uh, let, let's go ahead and. and uh, talk about metaphysical democracy real quick, uh, just because I, I really sure. like this. So, um, so actually, the quote I was getting, uh, I wanted to read, this is actually in his chapter on truth, but he talks about metaphysical democracy. So this is on page 103. Um, and I think this is one of my favorite quotes of the book. <laughs> um, so he says, in a metaphysical democracy, every object gets a vote, producing statements that only some humans find persuasive won't get you very far. If you want uh, to speak truthfully about icebergs, then it is not enough to convince your fellow scientists, some influential politicians, or even a bevy of soccer moms. <laughs> to have uh, real traction, you must also convince the icebergs themselves to line up behind what you say. If you want to make claims about honey, your alignment will have to cue not just uh, beekeepers, but flowers and hives and bees as well. Uh, the more bees that agree, the more substantial your claim becomes. When it comes to truth, appeals to authority carry only as much weight as the masses that such authority can muster. Blanket appeals to truth sponsored by absent gods, angels, platonic forms, natural laws, or noumenal things in themselves have no force. Um, and then uh, uh, just skipping down a little bit, um, uh, he's, he says in another paragraph, ideas and truths are objects that must persuade, negotiate, translate, and suffer like every other object. Um, so um, I think we mentioned in our last conversation, Le Levi Bryant uh, uh, asks like, so is this religion or politics? Um, it, it, it's an interesting, uh, interesting question. Um, but um, there's, I, I like this idea of the metaphysical democracy and that um, what does build patterns and uh, larger structures. So the reason that uh, things aren't just in a mass chaos of all the objects in the universe going their separate ways and not being able to congeal into any order is uh, there, there seem to be, uh, there must be some type of uh, emergent order uh, from them working together, right? So um, 
that, and that's the idea of this metaphysical democracy where the, the authority is, rests in the objects, uh, but they're still able to um, make a government and work collectively and, and, and build things. Um, so I, it would necessarily be a, a democracy, right? Uh, it, um, whereas a top-down structure, um, a fundamentally top-down structure would not be democratic. Yes. And it's it's funny to think about. I, I think I, we didn't we talk last time about. I said how basically your choice is either to be a tyrant or to be or to mesh with people, something like that. Uh, you know. Oh, I, I don't recall. But uh, go ahead and talk about <laughs> talk more about that. Uh, yeah. It's, so as a as a person, you either if you want things to be an exact certain way, then that means that that way isn't going to match what anybody else wants at all. Oh. So if it has to be exactly how you think it is, then that means that you're a tyrant. And the only other choice to that is to negotiate and persuade, like you were saying earlier. Yeah. Um, I have a, so uh, on, top, on top of the democracy thing, I wanted to say um, that similar to politics, uh, there's a phrase in there called politics all the way down. Uh -huh. And that again refers to our last uh, thing, our, our last con our last conversation, where um, uh, it, it's 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 frustrating and people hate to to hear about it. But I mean, let's take science uh, to to give a simple example. Some people like to say, "Well, you don't have to have politics; you have to have science." It's like, really? Well, to do quality science takes a lot of money and time. Who's gonna get it? And are you going to scientifically <laughs> decide that? Like, no, right. it's not. You're back to square one, which is politics, not science or inevitable truths. Um, so even even when you you get to something that is a proof, an indisputable proof, um, which proofs we get to figure out first, and how they're used, and how they're packaged, and how they're sold, um, uh, and 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 who gets to find them out, and all that. It's very political. Uh, yeah. I like the epistle. I like this paragraph, and it's really out of my league. Um, but if anyone is more experienced at philosophy, they will understand this. I've always hated, by the way, I've always hated epistemology, the field of epistemology. <laughs> I I just <laughs> think it's like okay, so I don't have a hundred percent proof of something. Guess what? Like that's we don't have a hundred percent proof of a lot of things but <laughs> that just goes back to my principle that faith is what moves everything. You know, I don't find <coughs> that the, the, epist yeah, like once, like for me, ep ep epistemology is about, you need to have the epistemological humility and then you move on mm -hmm. and anything else is not interesting or <laughs> especially not useful. And I've always felt like that, like I'm such an amateur noob at philosophy that I, I thought that if I were to say that everyone would just think that I'm an idiot. And so it's, it's great. Um, I take great consolation. And in the second paragraph of epistemology on page 68, um, okay. it says as a metaphysical term, Latour uses the word politics to signify this collapse of epistemology into ontology. Politics, politics is epistemology is ontology, or we might say, by politicizing representation, Latour ontologizes, ontolog ontologizes it. <laughs> In this sense, Latour asserts that against the ep epistemology police, one must engage in politics and certainly not epistemology. Yeah. With this move, okay, this is where it finally gets interesting and you can actually understand it. Uh, with this move, Latour claims to have removed, well, removed the principal source of infection, the traditional notion of rep representation that poisoned everything, the impossible distinction contradicted every day between ontological and epistemological questions to successfully follow and connect with the multitude of objects we have abandoned as largely illusory the demarcation between ontological and epistemological questions hmm. we have to, to successfully connect with all the objects we have abandoned because it's illusory it's it's totally a made-up line it's reductionism the demarcation between ontological and epistemological questions like such a diss on epistemology like <laughs> i i hate I've, I've always hated it and to just say it's all very political and and the way he uses politic politics is not 
simply the way I used it earlier. It's it's an also another cute way of saying that um, we must let uh, another throwback to science. You know, the icebergs. Uh, you have to let the icebergs have their say. Of course, the way that you get the icebergs, uh, my understanding is the way that you find out what the icebergs have to say is to go to science. Um, so this is just me, you know, trying to apply the book. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't know if that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not as. Uh, I don't know if Miller would agree with me or not, but. It, it's not as, uh, it's not as uh, anarchist as it might sound on the face of it, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. you, you got to, because you still have to build the coalitions, right? So, because, um, yeah. Like I mean, it's like radically democratic. Is yeah. How I, how I would put it. Well, it, and it, there's there's kind of this um, there's this uh, faith that we this this article of faith that we take on in democracy you know real democracy and politics that um, that it will work out um, if the democratic process um, is you know allowed to function uh, uninhibited and, and properly. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, timestamp, we're in 2020. <laughs> so, yes. There's a lot of overtones to that, but <laughs> it's August, 2020, it's August of 2020 <laughs> for, for future generations. Um, <laughs> so democracy has, a is, um, some, some, uh, interesting associations, but, um, so, but, but, um, because, um, I, I, I I've, I've had some, uh, conversations, uh, before about, uh, you know, people being kind of troubled troubled by what miller is saying here and what latour uh, has said um and you know i think it who, who who uh who like people you know yeah um so um well actually you know, so, yeah so with uh with uh, just lds uh, intellectuals uh okay uh, that, you know, they don't like the book it bothers them some, well some of them do some don't um but okay. um seen it as kind of the anarchist uh, side, you know, like anything goes, uh, there is no truth uh, type of thing. Um, mm. But um, is, I don't think it's, it's so much that, right? Because um, it, you can't just, um, you have to build, you have to bring people along. Like if you just say whatever you want and you're a lone voice and no one else, you can't get anyone to come along with you, then it's not going to carry much weight. Um, but to be able to carry, uh, to have influence, um, you have to engage in the politics, right? So, um, in, in a way there's a, it, it's still similar to epistemology in that you're having to do like, you're having to get down into, um, uh, what is it like, uh, oh, uh, canvassing, right? <laughs> Political canvassing. Uh, Cause mm -hmm. like, so, um. Uh, or like with your beehives or your or icebergs. Um, there's another example where uh, he uh, quotes Latour talking about soil samples, right? So you're, you're laying out um, a grid uh, to characterize the soil. And uh, you, I, I think of that as the political canvassing, right? You're really getting down into the neighborhoods and um, getting, getting the, the voice of, uh, of those groups. Um, and then what you say, you can, you can go back uh, to uh, back and say, hey, these are my constituents and this is what I learned from them. And you can actually say that authoritatively uh, rather than just saying something that you pulled out of nowhere um, uh, with, with no uh, authority, a uh, democratic authority of the voice of the people uh, behind you. So it's not arbitrary, I guess is, is, is what I mean. So I don't think it's as scary as it might sound. Well, and there's a part in there that says, uh, where it said, is it, it's that, hold on a sec. I got kids issues too, but. <laughs> Should we pause for a second? No, 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 no. Okay. There was a, one of my, my four-year-old was in the hallway and then. <laughs> um, no, there's a part where it says, it, admittedly, there's some relativism, but it's not. Yes. It's not the traditional version of it. it it's not the kind of relativism that devolves into nihilism mm -hmm. it's just more that there's a playing field and yeah it's 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 pol like politics isn't nihilism it's just it can be depressing when you think like jesus is going to come back and he's going to set everything right perfectly and there won't be 
you know, and, and in Revelation, when it says there's going to be tears wiped away, it means there won't be any more tears in the future. It doesn't say that, but I think right. people automatically okay, think yeah. that. It's like, no, it's like when your parent wipes away your tears, that doesn't mean there's not going to be more later, right? Yeah. Uh, Book of Moses, God who weeps. Um, and and that's a that's a great principle. I, I like how the Gibbons, uh, Terrell Gibbons, uh, points that out. Like you know, there's there's a long haul, and the the the, the idea of a celestial kingdom in in LDS theology is not one of no more pain. It's not like the Islamic one where you were just gonna. It's not like the traditional Christian one where it's like we're gonna worship God. We're gonna have wings and trumpets and worship God's glory all day, and it's gonna be awesome. Um, to me, that feels very culty, and then or the Islamic one where we're all gonna relax with our spouses and eat peeled grapes all day. Either it's it's, I mean, <laughs> both of those things will happen sometimes, but then you'll have to move on to other things. You know, seven day creative period, day of rest, a variety. Right. Mm-hmm. It's I, I think it's just uh, this this world pattern after the one that we used to live in and Mm -hmm. uh, the future one is the same and it's always politics and there will be ups and there will be downs and there will be no permanent downs and no permanent ups yeah yeah no problem cool Um, okay all right we took a quick break there um all right what were we talking about (laughs) Uh, i don't remember (laughs) Um, politics still i think so and uh something about religion (laughs) yeah i i I think i just said there's there's no there's no permanent you know there's no there's no permanent down no permanent up it's just all Mm. um, all very messy forever yes um i i was just I, there was one thing i wanted to uh ask you about so um you have a note here um atheism is not an objection to but an invitation to religious work yeah was that, that's was that a line from the book as well it is yeah let me find it uh, uh, yes i think it is Yes, page 134, right before the quote part. Okay. It says, when Latour asks, we'll be able to entertain, this is very uh, combative. I don't think he's necessarily singling them out, but it is very combative against new atheism. Okay. (laughs) Uh, It says, when Latour asks, will we be able to entertain a coherent form of atheism? That is to accept that the ordinary way of talking about religion today is through common sense atheism, which performs the same role as the common sense powerful gods of a bygone past. Um, Atheism is not an objection against, but an invitation to religious work. It almost seems very similar to paganism only. Mm -hmm. We admit up front that the the gods we choose are made up mm-hmm. from the beginning, from the get go. But other than that, it's kind of like my god versus your god, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, this is very interesting. So um, uh, and I am very interested in this idea of porting that um, Adam Miller talks about of, of porting religious ideas into um, some other type of framework um because um i do think there there are very uh useful religious ideas that i hope can be expressed and translated into language and worldviews uh like secular worldviews um that are more common today right so like uh i i kind yeah, of the, the religion for atheist book i think you'd really like it's very short, i do need to read that right way it's so quick it's such a quick read and it it gives um respect uh uh it gives a lot of its dues to it it says you know there's all these things that religion did that was great and then we threw that part away and only talk about the crappy parts it's like we can't bring the good parts back you know um like one of the ideas in there was that um you know uh it's like he's like okay so wait so wait a minute we're atheists 
and now we think that some sort of human government is going to solve everything and everything will be happily ever after. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Have you not paid attention to anything? <laughs> like the Christians are more in touch with like what humans are like and what is people are going to do than you guys are. Like fallen man is, you know, the myth part is fake, but the principle is true. Like right. we, <laughs> we, we've, evolved biologic we, we've evolved technologically much faster than our biological uh, evolving can keep up and we have to keep that in check and so it's like that whole natural man principle talked about in the book of mormon right um and there's also i can't remember the name of the group uh, but there's a guy named uh, ray kurzweil you know he's obsessed with technological immortality and he works for google um, oh yeah <laughs> him and some other people on this there's a, a group of um, technologists who who say that the highest priority should not be about finding new technology but about deciding you know whether a technology should be worth pursuing because we always are like let's invent this thing and then afterwards ask wait should we have invented that mm, yeah. <laughs> are we going to destroy <laughs> ourselves or are we going to wreck ourselves here with social media with with a nuclear bomb you know it's like we create it and then the cat's out of the bag the pandora's box is there and it's like why not make the decision yeah uh, uh we'll put the morals first and the science second uh you know you know and, and if people had latour's understanding of what religion and science were supposed to do we'd be doing that but instead um doing it the other way around is dangerous i think it mm -hmm. needs to destruct it personally uh, what's what's the other way around again sorry the other way around is this that that religion tells us about the that which isn't revealed and oh okay and, yeah. and about the future and and, and the stars and oh, okay yeah and, yeah and 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 science is just about science's domain is just about what's in front of us right uh yeah, yeah, that's a very that's a very interesting point. Yeah, I, I think um, well, so uh, I I find that uh, when uh, in in uh, in, in asking uh, the kind of questions that come up in well atheist questions, those are also religious questions because they concern uh, much of the same subject matter. And and um, once you start getting into existential questions of okay, well, um, what uh, what should I be doing? Um, then uh, it's uh, those are also religious type of questions, um, and um, I think that yeah, that attendance to the that attendance to what's right in front of you, paying attention, being open, um, is very important. Um, I actually, uh, I remember I attended a uh, a talk by uh, Marcus Borg, who's a Christian theologian, um, and uh, he uh, somebody had asked a, a question like, uh, how do I uh, be more open to God or, or something. And, and he had said, uh, pay attention, but <laughs> just as in general, right. Uh, you know, just mm -hmm. be aware of. Be less distracted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, um, Hubie Brown. Um, so the, uh, um, LDS, uh, apostle, um, uh, he had a line where he would say that, uh, um, uh, awareness is a measure of your aliveness and, uh, um, the more alive you are, the more aware you are. Something like that. I, I kind of butchered the line, but uh, but he re uh, relates uh, relates those two. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, yes, I think. Um, well, and uh, one other idea I was thinking about is is um, uh, Mormonism as a a uh, revelatory, an important revelatory moment in religious history, um, which I think. Mormons would, we Mormons would say yes, it is right. Um, um, a, a restoration, yeah. but maybe more than just a restoration, right? Um, uh, like so, uh, Dieter Uchtdorf uh, uh, talked about this ongoing restoration. Um, but it, in a way, it's kind of like you know how we Our use trans. Of faith nine. Yes, of faith nine. right. The, no, you know, the people mostly give that lip service. Mm -hmm. But if you're really going to take it seriously, then you should take Miller and the yes. God after type of idea and and science and, and um i've always for a long time i have thought the book of knowledge that reveals every single thing we know and spoken of an ether if that's actually a literal prophecy then the book is going to be 
written by scientists ah. and, histori- and historians, not, uh, you know, oh, here's God, he's, here's all his knowledge, I'm, you're finally ready to have all of it because you've been behaved well and you've been a good boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, I think it's going to be painstaking, you know, fought, well, it's fought for, knowledge that's uh-huh. worth having, it's always fought for. Oh, very right? interesting. Or, or 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 you suffer for it, or you endure for it, mm-hmm. or it's a gift, or it's or it's a gift through grace. So you know, it's always brought about in a in a powerful way. Yeah. Um. So well, you know, like uh, we we have these kind of terms that we use in one way, but then we kind of change the meaning as they go along. So translation is, is, is a big one, right? So uh, what does translation mean? Well, when we're talking about Joseph Smith translating the, the Bible, we don't really mean, I mean, he, he did study Hebrew and Greek, but that wasn't what he was doing when he was translating. He was, he was oh. getting revelation, right? It was, he was, an, it was in air quotes. <laughs> right, yeah. So it, not that it's wrong, it's just a different, meaning something different. So, and, and, and restoration, yeah. um, when when uh, when Uchtdorf talks about the ongoing revelation, don't miss out on, or the restoration, don't miss out on the restoration. It's not just bringing back what was before, right? It's he's meaning some whether uh, whether he's thinking of this or not, he might be. Um, but implicit in that is that uh, there's development, right? Progression, um, and uh, the restoration is more than just bringing back what was there before. That it, but it's actually developing and and bring. Uh, building up and making new things. Uh, I, I, that seems implicit in, in the idea. Um, and it, it, what's interesting is that uh, if, if we think about just a, a kind of many streams, right, but many streams of religious thought, East and West and uh, in the Americas and, and all kind of going along historically. Um, and, uh, you know, there's uh, the ancient Israelite religion, and there's rabbinic Judaism, Christianity, Protestantism, uh, all these ideas that are accumulating. And then um, there's uh, uh, the uh, scientific revolution, the enlightenment. And then um, Joseph Smith comes on the scene in the 19th century. There's this moment um, that there are these very just fascinating and productive ideas um, and, and we can see from this book uh, with, uh, with Adam Miller that the, the ideas are very fruitful, like they produce a lot, uh, that there's this moment in religious history that uh, the Mormon religion and the, the Mormon view and the, the, the genius of Joseph Smith contributes some very powerful ideas to it that I'm not sure um, have really, th- that the world has really uh, appreciated yet and taken advantage of. Yeah, yeah like, I feel he's the first to point out on a lot of things. Like, yeah, there there are a lot of times I hear about something that was from the second half of the 1800s or the first half of the 20th century, and they're like, "This is when this happened." I'm like, "That's just something similar to what Joseph Smith said." Mm-hmm. But, yeah, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely worth coming back to and and gleaning from, like. Um, and uh, trying to think, <laughs> how can this apply to my life? But, <laughs> um, but really, right, uh, um, in, in, in a deep sense, a lot, a lot of it can. Maybe in ways that we haven't noticed, right? I mean, uh, and, and the reason that can become kind of trite is because we don't continue to uh, look deeper and develop further um, um, the ideas. But there's a lot there and many, many layers um, underneath. Um, yes. Uh, another thing uh, you had noted here um, <laughs> is that why does Todd not fully go for it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what yeah, what, what did you mean by that? A, you made us. You made a minor thing that a minor quip. I can't remember what you said. That you, I don't know, maybe only ninety-five or eighty percent agree with the book or something. Or there's a okay. part of it that you didn't really that you know you were neutral about. I, I can't remember. Okay. Yeah. Remember. Oh, I, I probably said something like that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, and it kind of relates to our conversation last time. So, I mean, um, I, and it, it certainly relates to who I read, right? So I, I read a lot of, of Christian thinkers and people who are in the classical tradition. Um, so I can't help but be influenced by those. Um, and so it feels a little bit more natural, natural to me. Um, but uh, that's not to say that I don't like uh, what Miller is saying here. Um, and, I, I, uh, and kind of what I think is... Um, 
I'm, I'm very rarely at a point where I'm able to say like, okay, I've, I've made a decision and here's what I think <laughs> about a subject, right? Um, uh, just because that's, that's very hard to do. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll hold contradictory ideas in tension to kind of. Well, that, that's, that, that would be what Miller would advocate to do, right? Darn it, he got me. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, but seriously, yeah, that's, right. seriously, that's the kind of thing he would, that's what he would, that's what this book suggests doing implicitly. Yeah, well, so a few things to ramble off, and, and sorry, these aren't uh, quite as practical, but these are just kind of theoretical sure. thoughts. But sure. um, so, for example, um, you know, I'm listening to it and I'm thinking, oh, this is great. And, you know, uh, it's t it, the chapter on God, I didn't, it didn't really talk about what God is, uh, but kind of like, okay, what, what God would have to do in this type of system or what his, what the difference would be. Um, but uh, so, one of the things, say, say we have all these objects, these myriad objects in the universe, um, they would, on, in, a, in a classical view, they would be contingent. Like, why are they there? Where do they come from? Why do they exist? Um, and okay. like, what brought them into existence, right? So it's this necessity and contingency thing. So in classical theism, God is the necessity and then everything else is contingent that is created by it. Um, so, and, and so that's a question, right? Um, and so I tried to think of a few solutions to that. Um, so one was like, okay, well maybe everything is contingent, um, but I don't know how that would work. But, I mean, maybe, uh, I, I don't ha I, um, have a good, it, does, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but I, I suppose that's possible. I, I remember we talked with uh, Jacob a little bit about this before, like maybe there doesn't have to be necessity, but uh, I, I need to get into that more and see how that would work. Sure. Um, or maybe everything is necessary. Um, and so we have all these objects and for some reason um, they just have to exist, right? So like uh, um, there's this other idea in uh, Mormon thought with uh, Joseph Smith and the, uh, and the Pratts, especially Orson Pratt, that all things like uh, the kind of monads and um, all the particles, uh, sentient particles in the universe are um, eternal and uh, have existed forever and it's kind of just the organizations uh, of them that um, are uh, are the contingent and and, and non-eternal um, and that might be that, that might work um, and I have I have two questions for you sure sure first first off why is this I actually I know that your first answer is going to be a bit long so I don't say the second question <laughs> yet but the first question is why is this important to you because well, it's interesting. <laughs> to no, me. no, not just that. Uh, you know, they, it sounds like, okay. One of my favorite principles is the Alma resurrection principle, where he says, "There's a lot of stuff I don't know, but something I really, really, really wanted to know is about the resurrection." Mm, so yeah. I know a lot about that. So this sounds like this is a very important topic to you, whether things are contingent or not. Yeah, uh, it's not to me, obviously, um, and I, but. Um, but yeah, why, why, why is it important? To you? Well, yeah. So if, if there is, um, well, I mean, one of it, I, I do think my first answer is probably right. Uh, that, uh, uh, for some reason I find it an interesting, an interesting question. Uh, um, no, yeah, no, I, I, I believe you, but I, I just, is there I, something I else motivating? That, I didn't, yeah. I didn't yeah, think that was um, the number one reason. I think I, 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 I thought there was at least one other thing that was tied for first. Right. Oh yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, let me see if I can try and describe that or discover it. <laughs> um, so, um, it part of it is that, uh, it's, it's a different type of, yeah, I, I'm trying to say like in, in a way that doesn't sound, uh, so theoretical, uh, it sounds a little bit, more. so I guess if yeah, there is like, uh, if, if there is, um, a an order to the world uh to understand uh and to be in alignment with um right that, uh, that would be useful to know um and to to understand um and uh so what the, and, and the thing is that i don't even know if there is morally right so like uh like moral law i don't know if there is a necessity of that that seems to be more created that's more i'm i'm, I'm pretty much willing to go along with uh uh, Miller and Latour on that. It's like, well, we just go along with what 
everyone around us says and we try to get along. But it seems like scientifically, there's a little bit more to it than that. Like, um, uh, there does seem to be some type of governance um, <laughs> to, to everything. Um, right. And, and I guess I, I just like, I like to understand things and to have things kind of uh, make sense and fit together. Um, sure. And, um, and so is one of your beasts with the books that it's not more fully fleshed out? No, no. Um, I, I think it's actually quite fleshed out. Um, uh, there are, well, no, the, a lot of things are very fleshed out, but I, I, like when you, you were mentioning God, he doesn't seem to say much. Oh. I think he was being pretty coy on, you know, he's like, well, God is just one of many objects. And then he doesn't elaborate on what he yeah. thinks. I don't know if he's the being nature coy of that or... object is. He might yeah. be though, right? Maybe, maybe. I, I mean, I was looking for more. I was like, um, I mean, God didn't seem to have very much of a role in it. So I was kind of like, well, well, where, what is, yeah. what is God? Like what, what is like, why? Um, so for example, uh, say like, um, I mean, it seems like there should be able to be more than one God. It's, my, my guess is probably yeah. God would be just like a very influential and charismatic um, object among others that is able to wield a lot of influence, right? Um, over yeah. some area. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, I don't, did he say that? I mean, that's kind of what I gathered. Um, he leaves the room for the possibility of it. I, I just think that the title of the book is Speculative Grace. And this is yeah. again why I was disappointed by the foreword because the foreword is just kind of like, well, this was cute and that's it. And it's like, but there's so many other branches you could take from this book. You know, it's a very short book. Um, and he he really just lays out, he, he tries, it's, it's very disciplined. The chapters are short. Um, there, there is a moderate amount of repetition, but it's never wasted. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see. There, there's a chap, there's a chapter on morals. Um, that was the, it, so, it sounds like, uh, perhaps on the Euthyphro dilemma, you would really rather know for sure whether there's, it's, it, it sounds like you're not happy with, like it sounds like you're not happy with the ambiguity, right? Like you'd rather know whether God before or after is more accurate. And then Miller acts as if it's God after, but then he doesn't assert that it's God after. Mm, yeah. Would that yeah. be, would that be in the ballpark of why it's, why it's ruffling feathers? Um, well, so on, on the Euthyphro dilemma, um, that actually doesn't, bother me a whole lot um okay um i guess it's um i i was thinking like um uh S stephen hawking for instance have you seen the movie um about him <laughs> what was his name uh theory of everything i think um, oh, i'm sorry has the harry potter guy in it um so um but he talks about how uh like uh, cosmology is a religion for atheists or something uh, when he's meeting his uh, future wife. Uh, but uh, Stephen Hawking just strikes me as somebody who had this real drive to um, understand the way things worked um, at, at a grand scale. You know, he wanted to um, understand how the universe worked and how it came about and and he would even refer to like knowing the mind of God, even though he was obviously using it metaphorically, but he seemed to have yeah. a very, the way Einstein would. yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, it was um, uh, definitely very important to him. And I, I relate to that a lot. Like, um, okay. like I find um, studying the sciences and mathematics um, very uh, very rewarding um, and enlightening, um, sure. and, and just the, satisfying. The book, you know? the book gives the science its due, and it's, it says yes. the glacier. You need to ask the glaciers what they think. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I didn't si find that part uh, unsatisfying. I, I guess I just mean that. That's why. That's why this type of stuff matters to me, or why why it's interesting. Um, okay, okay. And and as far as like, uh, is if is, is there something in the book that doesn't? Um, I guess there's just uh, kind of an, un there are a few unanswered questions. Yeah, I, I guess that's a good way of putting it. Um, so, um, 
yeah, I guess the question would be like, where does all this stuff come from? Um, like where, wh where do all these objects, objects come from? Have they always been around or uh, did they, I mean, I, I, it seems like they would have to be. That'd just be one question I'd have. And maybe I okay. could ask, maybe I could ask Adam Miller. I can email him. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think he gets many emails, especially about this book. <laughs> right? Yeah. He probably, you know, an LDS. I, I mean, I, I mailed, I emailed Grant Hardy. I asked him to call me on my phone, and he did. And he did? Oh, cool. cool. Yeah, and he talked to me for like half an hour, and he was very nice. Nice. And I could tell he he didn't think I had much. You know, it wasn't something you wanted to dive into, but he was very respectful and he cool. was generous with his time. Uh, and Adam, uh, all the online presence I've seen of him, he's very, he seems very stern and serious, but he also seems earnest and open. Yeah. We, I, uh, I don't know if he's on Facebook anymore. We used to be friends on Facebook, but uh, oh, really? looks like he might have uh, uh, his emails kind wisely of, bowed out of that. Yeah, <laughs> he's a professor. I'm sure right. his email is probably published somewhere. Yeah, it's yeah. No, I wouldn't even say it's like a major, a major issue or a major gripe. It's just, uh, you know, it's just something I wondered about. It's like, huh, I, I, I don't know. Well, uh, work, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. He, he tries to mimic the disappointment that is set up by scripture, right? Like scripture, scripture is a how-to book, not an answers book. Mm -hmm. you know? True, yeah. Um, uh, I my I would imagine Miller's response would be something like, you know, if you're going to be impatient, you know, if, if you want to know, that's fine. Just make sure not to be building yourself a golden calf while you wait. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> right. And and for him and Latour, the go the golden calf would be reductionism mm -hmm. and anything that attempts to reduce. Dogma. Yes. Yeah. Well, and you know, there, that's another, that's another interesting, uh, uh, point. So like, I'm not, I'm not really opposed to reductionism. Um, so, uh, I think really? Daniel, no, not, not particularly. So, uh, well, uh, Daniel well, Dennett talks we should, about, we should, uh, we should, we should see what we, what you define reductionism as. Right. right. So there's, so Daniel Dennett, I think it was, who talked about greedy reductionism, which is like going too far with it. Like, so you're, you, you break, you okay. break things down into units where they're no longer uh, coherent or have functionality. Um, and right. um, so like certain things, um, if you break a, a system too far uh, and you can't see the way it all works together, um, then you've gone too far. So like take a human body. Um, if you want to understand the way the human body works, you need to, you can't go down to uh, subatomic particles um, because that's, that's going too far, right? right? You, you need to look at a right, higher- Or if you're making a recipe for oatmeal, you don't list out the number of carbon and hydrogen right. <laughs> atoms right. to make oats and to sugar and raisins or whatever. Right, um, but, uh, but in, uh, in scientific theories, generally um, you try to make them as, as applicable to as many scenarios as possible. Uh, so for sure. example, um, like uh, um, weight, for example, is a force, uh, uh, but if it's conflated with mass, then it's only going to work on earth. Um, whereas if you understand that weight is um, the force of an object due to gravity um, and that it, it, it includes this acceleration component, um, then you can understand that, okay, this, this applies in Earth. It's going to it's going to look differently, um, you know, in a different gravitational uh, or po different position in a gravitational uh, field or in a different gravitational field, different planet. Um, so sure. it generalizes the concept, but right? Right, but that's not reductionism. That's the opposite of it, isn't it? It's saying you have weight, and it's thing A in place A and thing B in place B, isn't it? That's a good question. I yeah, I get, I get, I'm getting a little confused on that one now. So um, I guess it's it's uh, I don't know if that would classify as reductionism. No, probably not. I, it does seem like a conspiracy theory, though, um, as as in it's kind of like a um, uh, a an overarching law that governs uh, behind the scenes. Sure. Uh, um, but I think there are ways to synthesize that, right? So um, like we could say that. Um, that arises democratically. Uh, like, I, I don't know that there's necessarily a direct contradiction um, between um, that type of view and um, the object-oriented view. Um, I think there are ways to make it work. Sure.
the, the only yeah the only thing I can think of that he really combats directly, other than like a generic boogeyman of religion, uh, the, the straw man of religion that science always sets up would be um, evolution, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 you know evolution is a reducer, and then um, science and religion both try to reduce. Um, evolution and they're both wrong about how they reduce it he says evolution is just something that like things do it's not some law someone made up it's and it's not even something that they have to do all the time Mm -hmm. Uh, and i bet if we were to look at like that like i mean like some some things are really really clear and obvious like the galapagos finch beaks Mm -hmm. right and there's other things that emerge that aren't logical like like say mutations mm-hmm. right uh there are things that evolve that are not always beneficial or that are neutral and they just are it's just what the things do it doesn't mean that we must extrapolate it to say um that everything about biology and creatures uh should revolve around it um and that the surviving of the fittest and conquering everything is the only thing that any type of creatures try to do. Um, uh, I, I love, uh, hold on, I gotta look this up. I can't yeah. What they're, uh, qua, no. What's the where, animal? Australian hugging. I'm trying to remember the name. I'm, of it. I'm so excited to hear what this is. It sounds awesome. Oh, it's, it's, uh, oh, what's it freaking called? Yeah, there it is. It's a tourist thing. Okay. Uh, oh, quokka. Yeah, have you ever heard of a quokka? It Q-U-O- sounds very familiar. I'm, ter- I'm sure I've heard it. It's this adorable rodent that has no fear oh, okay. of predators. Yes, I so have of heard of it. Of course, it's extinct on everything except the small island, and you go there, <laughs> and they're so friendly and chill, and people will get selfies with them, and they'll be like, yeah. And they smile right here. Let me hold on. Let me show you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let me. This is a crappy link. You want to share your screen? Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, let okay. me. I, I think I can. Let me give you. Uh, oh, disabled attendee screen. I, I just. I just changed it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> share, Are you going to sign some gray, waiver? Share, shared is grayed out. <laughs> oh. Uh, I thought I changed it. Oh, okay. Well, that's all right. Oh, wait, wait. No, it, I, I found it. Can you see this? Oh, there we go. Yes. Yes, I can. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So they just, uh, and the, the, the people put videos <laughs> on YouTube, and, and they, they'll go up to you and hug you. They'll just, oh, these are not. Uh, that's not quite as cute. Let me. Let me <laughs> that's cute. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, they just they, they they don't have any fear of anything. <laughs> oh yeah, this one. They don't. They they just kind of like like uh, it doesn't really make sense that these guys evolved. Yeah. Like like evolution says, everything's going to evolve into something that can try to eat everything else or avoid yeah. something that eats everything else. And that's not what really happened with them. They just kind of they just kind of do their own thing, you know, and, mm-hmm. and and their thing works for them and they live. And that's that's it. Um, you know, in, in Phineas and Ferb, there's a planet um, where cuteness is their currency, um, and uh, <laughs> and they have they have, have a <laughs> they have a, a a natural resource called cutonium that uh, uh, <laughs> gives people uh, excessive cuteness, and it can be dangerous because uh, you can become like uh, powerful and uh, a dictator if you have too much cuteness. <laughs> Because everyone wants to just listen to you. Yes. Um, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, anyway, so, uh, regarding evolution, yes, I did think that that section was interesting because um, evolution definitely is a very, um, well, so, yeah, I, I mean, uh, he kind of calls out that evolution does have a kind of top-down um, way of being presented. Um, it's very idolatrous. It can be, right? right? Now, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, you yeah, can yes, be yes. very careful with it, and describe it right. in a bottom-up way. Um, but yeah, I, I do think in practice, it's very difficult to not slip into 
um, I guess, yeah, making it as a very top-down structure and also over-applying it. I, I think I think the pendulum needs to shift a little bit. It probably is shifting, um, but uh, yeah, we've kind of seen like evolution explains everything, you know? <laughs> it's like the reason you do this isn't really because, uh, you know, you like it or because you love your children. It's because... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Evo because Psych. of evolution. <laughs> yeah, e e Evo Psych just really <laughs> irks me because it's like okay, it can be done legitimately, like you know, but yeah. it can be uh, it can be overdone. <laughs> it's like it's like okay, like like here's here's a classic one. Uh, I heard this guy say um, this is like the doubt. This is this one was one of the easiest ones to argue against. I heard this guy on a podcast a long, long time ago say. Um, that when men um, are committed adultery or, or have some new partner that they're not supposed to have, that they will have a uh, bigger load. And the evil <laughs> okay. psych explanation for that was because they want to reproduce more. Your body, right. your, your, your being wants to reproduce more. And I'm like, isn't it like, I mean, the longer you go, the bigger it is, and you're more likely to cheat if you're not getting any, <laughs> you know, like, like and that's, probably, that's, just a, that's just one other explanation, like, there's... And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why this is listed as an explicit podcast. <laughs> oh, sorry. For the occasion, for those occasional moments. People yeah. are probably wondering, like, all he, he, they just talk about really nerdy stuff. Why is this... <laughs> <laughs> but or, or there's also I'm giving the you a hard time the idea, of the, the idea of the forbidden arouses us yeah, more right like whatever what, what, whatever is considered um sacrilegious in each society uh it can be reflected in what's considered the most extreme porn there which varies from culture to culture mm. right yeah, um, yeah. and and so that that that's just what can get someone more aroused and it's like when you yeah, when you yeah. eat, there's an excitement factor there so yes there'd be more and, and it, but just that was the only thing he could think of and he was so insistent as he said it and i was like <laughs> that is like the laziest freaking explanation to yeah. that occurring I, i'm sorry that that's the example i came up with but it's like <laughs> It's really, okay. I don't, kind I don't of illustrates her, the point. <laughs> I don't hear, yeah, I don't hear or listen to Evo Psych stuff much anymore because it, they're so, it's so arrogant and theoretical, and I just just so stories like, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's like epistemology. It's like you know, <laughs> so, but I yeah, I, I like the book because you know, um, it 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 it's a humility it's like a humility that's not a full of itself. Like mm -hmm. it's not, it's not, Hey, you're never going to know. It's sometimes you don't know and you just have to let not, you know, you might find out in a year, you might find out in a million years that, yeah. tr 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 you know, true, uh, true humility um, is that it's not, insist it's not self-deprecate right like jesus was human was humble but he didn't wasn't self deprecatory he he yeah. humility is about uh firmly and consistently being willing to accept wherever the to, to look for the truth and accept wherever it comes from no matter how much we might want to, might not want to can be this person that we hate mm -hmm. and we don't like and yet that's the person who knows the answer to something you know, no one likes that. And most of the time we don't do that. We, we, we hear something. If, if there's a person we don't like, it doesn't matter how right they are. We don't want to listen to them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it can be those very people who, who know something uh, when pretty much no one else in our life does and being able to, to do that, to just say, you know what? I can't stand this person, but they're right. You know, yeah. that's, that's hard. That's hard. Um, and I, I just, that's, that's what the book kind of espouses. And I, I don't really feel that religion or science really traditionally go for that. They, they wallow into their politics, they, 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 they follow into, fall into their mire of their politics without even acknowledging that that's what they're waiting in. Mm -hmm. And, and Miller doesn't pull, doesn't make any, he, he's not fooling himself you know yeah and he's trying to convince everyone else you know and like he's very socratic like you know uh let's not fool ourselves 
and he really means ourselves. It's not like it's not you know the royal we. Right, <laughs> right. You fool yeah. yourself. I'll say, don't fool our. Let's not fool ourselves. But really, I mean you. He really means <laughs> let us not fool ourselves. That that's yeah. how I take the book. Yeah, very uh, much. When yeah. I was lost in the cosmos, which I love dearly, does have a little bit of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I know better than you factor to it, which I don't blame it for him for it being a Catholic grow it being in the south (laughs) (laughs) you know he's gonna have a chip on his shoulder i can tolerate that but but miller you know he he seems to be kind of more like he's trying to emulate the jesus or the god who's like trying to have a relationship with you kind of a thing you know we're all just objects together Mm -hmm. kind of a thing so i i admire that i think that's just how it really is yeah I I uh, I share your uh, endorsement. I think this is my third reading of it, uh, so I I definitely uh, right. enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I, I keep coming back first, to it, but I will definitely I will definitely read it a second time within the next five ten years easily. Awesome, yes. awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I hadn't read it for I, I read it again to prepare for our conversation here, so and, and I really I enjoyed that. it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I I enjoyed it, and I was like, oh yeah, I remember. I, I really liked this book, so I, I'm glad I did. Um, it, it's, it's definitely a good one. And, 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 you know, I, I, I liked, I think you said how, uh, um, it's quite concise. Um, uh, like it's not a very long book, but it, like every sentence has a lot of, a lot there, you know? Um, yeah, the, you know how it is with academic stuff. It can get really bloated and, and, and needlessly big words and, yeah. and take way too long to make its points. And then there's other ones where they like, really know how to edit themselves yes yeah this book is well edited yeah agreed yeah he so he's i mean uh so there's this uh analytic continental kind of camp and philosophy where so he he's continental but um uh but definitely like um it's like a, a very literary um and enjoyable uh to read also i mean it's it's very deep uh, profound thoughts and and not easy uh, to follow, but it's it's also uh, it's an enjoyable experience. I think uh, it's not hard going. Yeah, yeah. He, he he tries to make it a little tries to make it a little bit accessible to the freshman, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and acknowledge his own religious roots and uh, and part part of that's just kind of Latour too. You know, he's French, <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. the, the the French love to mix things together it, the, the, it's a very french feeling mm-hmm. like a very french spin on mormonism i i would say just kind of throw everything together and show how everything relates uh you know and, and everything can be a cause of sorrow and despair <laughs> or awesome you know just depending on how things go very, that's where the very french the next leap forward in, in Mormon thought will be from France, the French Mormons. <laughs> right. Yeah, if there are no. any left. <laughs> <laughs> you, heard, you heard it here first. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other thoughts you want to go over? Uh, should probably wrap it up soon. Oh, yeah. You're really <laughs> I don't need to feel as bad. Um, no. I'm just getting going. I'm on my second win. <laughs> Me, uh, I think I've covered most of what I want to talk. Uh, there's stuff that you haven't gotten to. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to recommend to you again, uh, Jack Miles' God a biography. Yeah, yeah it's. Um, it's very Hebrew-ish. Uh, there's, it's, it's there. I, I I forgot about this part. There's, it gets into. It's one of those books where the guy actually knows his Hebrew, and sometimes he gets into the Hebrew terminology. And um, cool. It's 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 systematic and artful, and he he um. Like basically, it's like if you were God and you had to deal with all these people and you're all powerful, what would you do? And the Book of Genesis, you have God saying. You know, uh, I'll tell them what to do all the time. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. in the Garden of Eden, that doesn't yeah. work. Okay, well, uh, if there's if there's this, uh, I'll destroy them. You know, okay, now I'll separate that. You know, everything he, he manages to show how all the stories um, through the Pentateuch 
are God like learning his lessons, so to speak. Though if you were looking at it from a more agnostic atheist way of things, um, it would just be kind of like, look, uh, the, we, we can't take an all-powerful God serious because every single one of these scenarios, it doesn't work out. That's kind of the argument he makes. He, he, he does everything but come up short of saying that he's an atheist. Uh -huh. um, his sequel, which isn't as good, but is still good, um, is a little more direct where he says, um, you know, the, the, the Christians and the Jews, uh, they thought they were going to conquer the Romans. And God promised them that they would, and then they didn't. Hmm. Yeah. So the only alter so so if God still exists, the, you, then basically God changed his mind or was a failure. Otherwise, there's no God, and so that's why um, in Christianity, He's a God who comes down to say, you know what, I'm not going to fix all your problems, but I can experience them with you. Oh, <laughs> you, see, I thought you were going to say something different. I I thought you were going to say. Um, they did conquer the Romans, but um, it took hundreds of years. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, the Romans weren't really conquered, and when they were, it wasn't by Christians; it was by pagans. And but uh, they all became Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. Eventually, well, Christianity didn't conquer in that way. Um, right. Of course, the way it's conquering now is not. Uh, there's a what did someone say? I saw a great tweet about evangelical Christianity that said, um, uh, evangelical Christians have traded persuading people of the divinity uh, and grace of Jesus for conquering them in the political arena. Hmm. hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, was like, uh, that was just really, well, really blunt. Yeah. I'll have uh, to read the Jack Miles book. That sounds very interesting. I, I mean, like I have mentioned before, I, I am very interested in this development of uh, both of religion and also like the idea of either God just doing things differently or God changing. Um, uh, one of those. Oh, it's very um, much that. So, um, but, but, it, but that gets back to what I was talking about of this moment of Joseph Smith and this restoration, this revelatory moment where Mormonism uh, brings these ideas um, mm -hmm. that we still haven't realized yet, you know, in, in, in the world. Um, but they're there, you know, uh, that, uh, that, that's a moment, right. Among others. But. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in all the other religions that somehow, um, Christianity did away with, um, the idea of a trickster God, which is heavily touched upon in Pearl of Great Price and the mm -hmm. temple. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the idea of multiple gods and how they relate, um, uh yeah just 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 tons of stuff in there um that i think he he brings to oh, the service yeah um yeah I, I think it's funny that you said the god of this world um lately because in second corinthians 4 4 it says the god of this world is satan <laughs> right right yeah yeah <laughs> Which, uh, you know and i think a lot of people think that thing and it's like no that's that's not that's satan isn't really the god of this world he just thinks he is and it's like no second corinthians 4 4 right says that he paul thought that 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 satan was it's it's a tie it's, it's a tricky title of course he means yeah this world as opposed to a superior world slash the universe slash heaven right. yeah this world obviously referring just to the crappy earth celestial kingdom or well yeah and i'll have to still. i wonder if that related at all because you know with gnosticism there was a the idea of uh yes being, yeah, um, yeah yeah yes yes uh, gnosticism Mormonism has a much more in common with not the, the, have you read the Gnostic Bible? You would um, love that. Now, when you say the, the Gnostic Nag Bible, uh, uh, it, yeah, uh, okay, so that's what you mean, the Nag Hammadi Library. Um, some of it. So yeah, the, the Nag Hammadi Library and the uh, the the Gnostic Bible, which is a title given by the editors. Uh, oh, okay. The the overlap is maybe seventy percent of the books, okay. uh, but the Gnostic the Gnostic Bible. Bible has great introductions to all the books, though. Oh, so um, this is a, this is like one particular volume you're talking about. Is, it's yeah, it's titled. Bible. It's called the Gnostic Bible. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to check that out. It's a great book. Uh, yeah, the Nag Hammadi Library you can get for free in PDF form and has um, different translations. Oh, that's the other thing. The the translations on the Gnostic Bible is really good. 
Cool. Uh, but not everything in it is a Nakamadi. Just a lot of it is. There's a lot of other stuff that's not Nakamadi. So anyway. Yeah, um, I haven't I haven't I learned it. Yet, so I'll have to read it in <laughs> translation. But, uh. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, the the the, 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 the Gnostic and the thing is, is that Ephesians, um, and some other, you know, Paul is very Gnostic. Um, and then traditional Christianity just kind of bats its eye at it. And I just think, hmm, yeah, that's the thing. I think Joseph, um, one of the many things Joseph Smith uh, sought to revive, mm -hmm. such, uh, restore, I should say. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah interesting. Anyway. Cool. All right. So I'll so let we you, wrap up there. Yeah, it's, it's late. It was uh, good doing another session. Yeah, yeah. I was glad to get the opportunity to get into this book. It's a, it's a good one. So it was fun to discuss. Very interesting yes. uh, subject matter. I think so. Oh, cool. All right. Well, I'll talk to you later. Thank you very much for coming on. Okay. Yep. You All too. Right. Good seeing you. All right. Have a good night. Great. You too.